Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, we have, in addition to our agenda today, uh, we are fortunate to have our uh, very new uh, CDC director and ATSDR administrator, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, uh, who uh, began, uh, uh, take, who took over as the CDC director last week, uh, here to share with us some comments and um, and uh, and welcome um, and, and introduce herself to the ACIP members. Dr. Walensky. Thank you, Dr. Cohen, and thank you all for inviting me here today and um, to meet with all of you. And, you know, I'm very proud to serve as the very new CDC director, and I'm just really grateful to be part of this incredible CDC community. Um, I want to mention that I am recognize the critical importance of immunization practices. And while you all have doubled down on your work um, during COVID, I also recognize that your work is critical, not just during times of COVID, but really for important childhood as well as adult immunization practices. Um, I'm happy to have ASIP as the advising guider of CDC guidelines and rec uh, recognize the really important independent role that you all play um, to review the safety and efficacy data that we have um, prior to giving uh, this to the American pub these vaccines to the American public. And I recognize that this um, represents an enormous dedication on all of your parts. Um, the timely assessment of safety data and detailed plans for real world effectiveness um, being discussed at these meetings are really value added for um, the CDC and really um, are critical to what ASIP provides. We all recognize that this is a dynamic process and as we learn more recommendations and implementations may change as we um, are using the vaccines to maximum benefit. Um, and I wanna especially thank you for your commitment to this process and for your abil ability and scientific expertise to deliberate on all of this um, in uh, real time and in a systemic way. Um, I'd like to highlight the importance as we've been saying over and over and as is critically important to me on, on health equity in our discussions um, and recommendations. Um, I recognize there's a huge amount of work ahead to communicate the effectiveness and the safety and, um, of these vaccines, um, not just vaccines for COVID, but vaccines for all um, Americans and to uh, support immunization as part of that um, COVID pandemic response. Um, uh, and I look forward to learning more from you as you continue um, to deliberate new vaccines that are on the horizon and new vaccines to come. And I um, appreciate the work that you've done to date. Um, up until about a month ago, I was a practicing infectious disease physician, and I have relied on ASIP over my career, and I'm proud to call many of you colleagues and friends. So I just wanted to thank you for, um, for having me today. I know that um, the, the meeting that you're having today was a, a newly planned meeting and that you have put in an extraordinary amount of time and energy um, through your career, but over this last year, especially in thinking about um, vaccine safety and effectiveness. Um, and probably we'll have a lot more of that to come as um, hopefully new vaccines emerge. So thank you so much for all you offer to ASIP, to the CDC, and to the American population. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Walensky. Um, Dr. Romero, um, do you have any uh, words uh, for Dr. Uh, Walensky before we let her go? I know she just had a few. Yes, days. thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I'll make it very quick. I know that your your schedule is very tight and you're probably trying to get a lot done in a very short period of time. So um, on behalf of the uh, uh, ACIP, its voting members, liaisons, ex officios, um, it, we, we welcome you and um, we, we're happy to hear that, um, that uh, you know our work is recognized um, and uh, that it is beneficial uh, in advising you. And we look forward uh, in working with you and providing you um, recommendations into the future. So thank you very much, very much for taking a time out of a very busy schedule to talk with us. Thank you, Dr. Walensky. Um, we are going to move back into our regular agenda. Um, we are hoping uh, and know that Dr. Walensky will be with us again over the coming months. Um, uh, but Dr. Romero, um, are you, should, are everyone ready to go into our discussions around vaccine safety? I believe we are. So uh, let's go ahead then, um, uh, Dr. Lee, um, would you please talk about the, 
Vaccine Safety Technical Subgroup, vast introduction. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Romero and Dr. Cohn. Um, and also wanted to take a moment to thank Dr. Walensky for her leadership. Um, and we are look very much looking forward to collaborating going forward. Um, for today, uh, you know, I'm happy to be able to provide an update on behalf of the VAST group, which includes my co-chair, uh, uh, Dr. Bob Hopkins, uh, who is uh, currently chair of the National Vaccine Advisory Committee. Next slide. Um, as a reminder, here are the objectives of the COVID-19 Vaccine Safety Technical Subgroup, which we just call VAST for short. Uh, the group has been convened to review, evaluate, and interpret post-authorization or post-approval COVID-19 vaccine safety data to serve as the central hub for technical subject matter expertise from federal agencies conducting post-authorization or post-approval safety monitoring, advise on analyses, interpretation, and data presentation, um, and we also uh, provide updates to the ACIP COVID-19 Vaccines Working Group and the ACIP on COVID-19 Vaccine Safety. Next slide. Uh, the role of VAST is also to ensure uh, independent review of the data from all safety surveillance systems um, and to support transparency and public accountability for COVID-19 vaccine safety monitoring. Um, I co-chair this group uh, with my colleague, uh, Bob Hopkins. Uh, we have membership that includes um, ACIP and NVAC representation, as well as independent expert consultants. Uh, we have two CDC co-leads, uh, Lori Markowitz and Melinda Wharton, um, who, to whom we are very grateful for their leadership um, uh, during this um, uh, incredibly busy time, and eight uh, ex officio members and liaisons from the FDA, NIH, OIDP, CMS, HRSA, Indian Health Service, VA, and the DOD, and all are providing critical expertise um, uh, through their work and uh, through their surveillance systems. Next slide. In the pre-authorization phase, as you may recall, from June to October of 2020, VAST had met 10 times to prepare for COVID-19 vaccine safety surveillance. In November, we actually transitioned our membership to our current group focused on uh, reviewing the uh, safety data. And between November and mid-December, we had four meetings to review the methods for COVID-19 vaccine safety monitoring um, and to finalize the VAST procedures. Next. Um, as a reminder, the ACIP voted to recommend use of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine on December 12th. And on December 14th, the very first dose of COVID-19 vaccine was administered in the US. On December 19th, the ACIP voted to recommend use of the Moderna vaccine. Next slide. And on December 21st, VAST had its first call to review the safety data exactly one week after the first dose was administered in the US. And we have had six meetings to date to review the data and we are only six weeks into the vaccination program in the US. Next slide. Um, at this point in the vaccination program, we have been primarily reviewing information from vSafe, the VA Adverse Drug Event Reporting System, which feeds into our uh, national VAERS uh, databases, and CISA. Next slide. And we're just beginning to see some very early data from two of our systems that have population-based data available. Next. As a brief description of our process, uh, we are currently doing a weekly review of available data on vaccine administration and adverse events of special interest. We believe in a, a model of shared learning about safety. Um, all members, federal partners, and subject matter experts are present for the presentation of data from multiple systems. In, um, and in order to ensure independence, VAST members also have a separate session to discuss the findings. Finally, VAST provides a summary and interpretation of the aggregate data to the ACIP Secretariat on a regular basis, and we're committed to ensuring ongoing and regular communication with the ACIP COVID-19 Vaccines Workgroup and the ACIP in our open public meetings. Next slide. Today, you'll hear a broad range of vaccine safety updates from Dr. Tom Shimabukuro, um, who is providing a summary of key information shared by multiple safety surveillance systems. Um, and we'll finish this session with a discussion and vast interpretations of the findings to date. Next slide. 
And I would just like to take a moment to thank our vast members, our CDC co-leads and our ex officio and liaison representatives. Um, all of these individuals have gone above and beyond um, in dedicating their time and expertise to support the vaccine safety system in the US since day one of our vaccination program. Um, so, uh, you know, I just cannot express enough how much I appreciate our colleagues who are willing to get on the phone uh, for many hours during the week to be able to put this together. So um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Tom Shimabukuro. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And uh, good afternoon or good morning, um, depending on where you are. Today, I'll be giving a COVID-19 vaccine safety update. Next slide. Next slide. I'll be covering vSafe. I'll be giving a VAERS surveillance update, a CESA project update, a VSD surveillance update, then an update on anaphylaxis following COVID-19 vaccination, and finally, uh, uh, <clears throat> a summary of data on reports of deaths and mortality following COVID-19 vaccination. Next slide. So starting off with vSafe, next slide. Just to remind you, vSafe is our smartphone-based uh, vSafe is our smartphone-based um, text-to-web survey monitoring system. And for the for the data that I'm going to present today, I'm going to be focusing on the 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 week one, the zero to seven days, where we do daily check-ins and ask questions about reactogenicity. We also do a health impact assessment um, after. After that first week, we, we um, do weekly check-ins doing health impact assessments up to six weeks and then three, six, and 12 months. And uh, if a person um, reports on these, one of these health impact assessments at any check-in um, that they receive medical care, we follow up in VAERS um, to take a VAERS report if appropriate. Next slide. So our enrollment in vSafe has, has been brisk. Um, you see in this table, you have the, um, the, the, the total number of reported uh, dose one doses in the United States for the two vaccines. And um, that's a total of about 21.8 million. And we have just under a million uh, vSafe registrants that have completed at least one health check-in for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and just over a million for the Moderna vaccine. And to date, we have um, detected uh, just over 15,000 pregnancies reported to vSafe. Now, we have been enrolling individuals in the vSafe pregnancy registry. And, and I will say that not all of these 15,000 pregnancies reports are actually pregnancy reports. Um, people do make um, kind of fat finger mistakes on the uh, smartphone. And we have um, some males or we have some individuals that are out of the age group. And that's, um, and so not everyone. Um, of these 15,000, um, again, are, are pregnant women. Um, that's just one of the limitations of the system, but we're actively enrolling in our registry. Next slide. So this is a uh, table shows the reactogenicity that in the enrolled individuals are reporting um, day zero through seven. It's kind of a combined analysis. And I first wanna focus on this first column here this is all vaccines, all doses. And you can see pain is a commonly reported symptom as are systemic reactions as well. Fatigue, headache, myalgia, chills, fever, swelling, joint pain, nausea. Next slide. The next comparison I wanna draw your attention to is the dose one for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine versus Moderna dose one. And for this presentation, we're only presenting dose two for Pfizer because of the, uh, th that's really the only vaccine, Pfizer because of the 21 day interval and it's starting um, earlier. Um, we only have dose two really meaningful data for, 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 for Pfizer. But just focusing on dose one for the two vaccines, you can see that these are very similar reactogenicity profiles. Uh, pain is commonly reported. And then um, some of these other systemic reactions are commonly uh, reported um, and in similar um, proportions for the two vaccines. Next slide. The last comparison I, I want to draw your attention to is the dose one versus dose two for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And uh, I think you can see that 
if you look at the systemic reactions, there is substantially more systemic reactogenicity being reported after dose two. So for fatigue, headache, myalgia, you know, anywhere from twofold to threefold higher um, reactogenicity being reported for, for, for dose one versus dose two. And this is actually, if you break the data down more, it's primarily on, on day one versus uh, day one versus day one of the zero through seven day observation period. And that is consistent with uh, what was observed during the clinical trials and that there was more reactogenicity reported after dose two. Next slide. So follow-up phone calls are ongoing with VSA participants who reported medically attended health impact events. And we are enrolling, in the, we're enrolling individuals in the pregnancy registry. Next slide. So moving on to VAERS, just to remind you again, VAERS is the nation's early warning system for vaccine safety. It is a spontaneous reporting or passive surveillance system that's co-managed by CDC and FDA. Next slide. The strengths of VAERS are as it can rapidly detect safety signals and can detect rare adverse events. The main limitation for VAERS is, 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 is that it is not designed to assess causality. However, VAERS accepts all reports from anyone regardless of the plausibility of the vaccine causing the event or the clinical seriousness of the event. It is a hypothesis generating system to identify potential safety concerns that can be studied in more robust data systems if necessary. Next slide. So this is just a break, general breakdown of the reports in VAERS um, for, the, for the two vaccines. Um, you'll see on here that there are substantially more um, Pfizer-BioNTech reports than Moderna and a little bit of a difference in the serious versus non-serious. We think this is uh, an artifact of report processing times and that the Pfizer vaccine came out earlier and that as we have continued to get more reports um, where we are focusing on, on, on processing and reviewing and coding the serious reports um, initially, and that's why we think we have a, a bit of an artifact there for the Moderna reports compared to Pfizer. But if you look at the bottom, the total, we have about 90% um, non-serious, about 10% serious. Median age is 43, likely representing the, um, the age of the healthcare, the, the demographics of the healthcare workforce, and about 77% in, in females, also possibly representing the uh, demographics of the healthcare workforce, but in general, there are more female reporters um, in VAERS than male. Um, the reporting rates for non-serious adverse events are 372 per million doses administered, and for serious, 45 per million doses administered, and these are comparable to what we see for other vaccines that are given to adults. Next slide. Uh, here is a, a look at the specific adverse events being reported um, for the two vaccines. Um, these are not mutually exclusive, so you can have more than one adverse event in a single report, um, but systemic reactions are the most commonly reported adverse events as well as injection site re reactions. And the, um, the adverse event profiles in, for the reporting to VAERS are, are remarkably similar for both the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. Next slide. So our colleagues in FDA conduct empirical Bayesian data mining, and uh, they use data mining to identify disproportional adverse event reporting for vaccines, including COVID-19 vaccines. It identifies with a high degree of confidence adverse event vaccine pairs reported at least twice as frequently as expected for a COVID-19 vaccine compared to the VAERS database. And that means the lower bound of the 90% confidence interval surrounding the empirical Bayesian geometric mean, the EBO5, is two or more compared to all other U.S. licensed vaccines. And as of January 22nd, the last weekly run, there have been no empirical Bayesian data mining alerts detected for any adverse event COVID-19 vaccine pairs. Next slide. So moving on to the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project, which is a CDC collaboration between um, se with seven uh, medical research centers with vaccine safety experts. Next slide. 
So CISA has implemented um, COVID Vax, which is an extension of CISA, the CISA Project's clinical consultation service for U.S. healthcare providers and health departments for complex COVID. 19 vaccine safety questions and issues that are about individual patients residing in the United States or are not readily addressed by CDC or ACIP guidelines. Um, the CISA project has vaccine safety subject, subject matter expertise in multiple specialties and subspecialties. And in the last part of the slide, you can see the information for, for how uh, US healthcare providers can request a CISA consult. Next slide. So, um, as of January 24th, CISA has responded to 143 clinical inquiries or consultation requests about COVID-19 vaccine safety. Many of these have been about allergic reactions and anaphylaxis or about individuals who might be at higher risk for adverse events. They've also assisted state health departments with the evaluation of complex medical issues pertaining to COVID-19 vaccine safety. They convened a, pro, uh, a work group with allergy and immunology specialists that provided input for CDC's guidance and on clinical considerations for the use of messenger RNA COVID-19 vaccines and how to prepare for managing anaphylaxis after vaccination. They've also contributed to publications on anaphylaxis and allergic reactions after the first dose of both the Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna COVID-19 vaccines. And are engaged in ongoing work to investigate possible mechanisms for anaphylaxis in collaboration with FDA, NIH, and other partners. Next slide. So now I'll, I'll give you a quick update on some early data from the Vaccine Safety Data Link, which is a collaboration between CDC and nine participating integrated healthcare organizations you see here on the map, with data on over 12 million persons per year. Next slide. So the vaccine safety data link um, has EHR and administrative data on immunization records, encounters with the healthcare system, um, birth and death certificate information and demographics, all linked by unique study IDs. Um, also has rapid access to charts and electronic healthcare records if we need to go in and review a case and confirm it's an incident case. Next slide. Uh, the VSD rapid cycle analysis aims are to monitor the safety of COVID-19 vaccines weekly using pre-specified outcomes of interest among VSD members and assess each pre-specified outcome for a 1 to 21 and 1 to 42 day risk interval. Um, that's actually most outcomes. You'll see the, the, the intervals on, on, on the following slide. There are a couple that aren't 1 to 21 and 1 to 42. So the reason we have these, these two intervals, um, at the, the first, the one to 21 day is largely based on the dosing interval for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, um, which, uh, which is the recommendation is to get your second dose at, at, at three weeks. Um, the one to 42 day risk interval is a more of a traditional um, risk interval that we use for vaccine safety. We're also gonna describe the uptake of COVID-19 vaccines over time among eligible VSD members. Next slide. So here's a, uh, a look at the vaccination data through January 16th. And uh, these are, this, the numbers are kind of small, uh, but you, on the left-hand side, you have Moderna in the middle, Pfizer. Then on the right-hand side, you have total. And the totals are about 162,000 doses, first dose doses administered through January 16th, and about 34,000 dose two. Um, we anticipate we'll get substantial um, vaccination um, in the VSD population when we um, move to more, a more, a more broad-based uh, immunization program and start vaccinating the general public. Next slide. So here's a look at uh, that same data, but by age group. And uh, once you focus on the right-hand side under the total doses, um, but you'll see most of these doses are administered in the age group 18 to 49 years, a substantial number in the 50 to 64, and then smaller numbers in the 65 to 84 and 85 plus. Um, this likely represents um, the VSD vaccinating a lot of, of healthcare workers, many of which fall into that 18 to 49 year old age group. Next slide. So uh, these are the preliminary results of the VSD unvaccinated concurrent comparator analyses 
Um, the outcomes there are on the, the left-hand column. I know this is a, a busy slide, um, but these are the uh, 20 plus, I think 21 outcomes or maybe 22 outcomes that we are, are monitoring. Um, the, the type of analysis we're doing right now is the unvaccinated concurrent comparator. That allows us to get data, um, the, get the data, um, the quickest data, if, if you will. Um, we have other analyses which will come online fairly shortly. And you see the risk intervals, you see the events in the vaccinated, events in unvaccinated. And then the signal right now is, is based on a, on, a, on, a, on a rate ratio and, uh, and a p-value. And as you can see, for, we're, we're still fairly early on. For a lot of these um, outcomes, there are actually no events in the vaccinated individuals. So we, we, we actually can't do an analysis on those. But for the ones we can, um, we have no signals yet. Next slide. So the next steps, um, uh, our next analysis that we're going to move to is the vaccinated concurrent comparator analysis. And that will start when we have informative comparator follow-up available, which we expect within a week or so. Um, we'll do dose one and dose two analysis for each vaccine. Um, we'll also do a historical comparator analysis, and that will come online a little later, probably around mid-March. Next slide. Um, moving on to an update on anaphylaxis. Next slide. So suspected anaphylaxis reports to VAERS um, through the analytic period January 18th were detected through early screening to identify suspected anaphylaxis reports prior to formal processing of these reports in MEDRA coding, um, and also detected through a MEDRA code search strategy after formal processing and coding. So these are, these are basically, this is like a Venn diagram. There's two categories of reports. Um, most for most of these two methods, there's overlap. Um, so, um, but but there are, are a few reports in the in the pre-screening and a few other reports in the what we call post-processing um, that are independent. We've included all these reports captured through both these methods. These suspected anaphylaxis reports were assessed by physicians at CDC who CDC who conducted medical record review and additional follow-up is necessary, and that would be contacting the healthcare provider, the treating physician, um, the healthcare facility where they were treated, in some cases, the patient themselves, many of which were healthcare providers. Um, these, ca these cases were classified according to the Brighton Collaboration Case Definition Criteria. Um, Brighton levels one, two, and three are considered cases, with one being the highest level of diagnostic certainty. Um, cases that are classified as four or five are considered not cases. And CDC and FDA um, met daily to uh, discuss and further adjudicate cases if necessary. Next slide. So here's a table showing the characteristics for the, the cases, the confirmed cases through January 18th. For the Pfizer BioNTech, there were 50 cases that met Brighton criteria. And for Moderna, there were 21. Um, the median age and range are, are very similar between the, 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 the two vaccines. And you might expect that given that um, this was during a time where um, it was basically the phase 1A were being uh, targeted and there's a likely mostly healthcare workers. Um, there is a strong female predominance for both vaccines, 94% um, of the cases for Pfizer BioNTech and 100% from Moderna. Um, I, I will say that um, about just over 60% of the initial doses have been administered in women. And um, prior anaphylaxis, prior surveillance reviews and bears of anaphylaxis have also noticed this female predominance as high as 80 80% um, on a previous uh, review that, that looked mostly at flu vaccine. These cases tended to occur um, quickly after vaccination. Um, 10 minutes was the median onset um, for both vaccines. Uh, the overwhelming majority had symptom onset within 15 minutes, and then most, 90% for both, had onset within 30 minutes. Um, high percentages in both, uh, in the cases for both of the vaccines, um, documented a history of allergies or allergic reactions many to drugs and foods, 
and a substantial percentage uh, had a history of prior anaphylaxis. Um, and this occurred following drugs, foods, contrast media, vaccines, insect stings, and in some cases, unspecified. Um, most of these cases for the both vaccines occurred after first dose, and this likely represents where we are in the, in the immunization program right now, although there were um, a handful of second dose um, anaphylaxis cases as well. Next slide. Here's a figure um, showing the onset. Um, as you can see, there is clustering within 15 minutes of vaccination. Um, nine, again, 90% for both vaccines occurring within 30 minutes and um, several cases with onset greater than 30 minutes. Um, you see three going up to 45 minutes and what, what's not shown on this graph are several others where there's a 54 minute, a 90 minute, a 150 minute and a 20 hour onset. Next slide. So um, based on updated uh, vaccine doses administered counts and updated anaphylaxis cases, um, which there's roughly 9.9 .9 million um, Pfizer-BioNTech doses administered through the anal analytic period and about 7.5 million from Moderna. We estimate a reporting rate of five per million doses administered for Pfizer-BioNTech and 2.8 million cases per million doses administered for Moderna. The previously reported rate for Pfizer-BioNTech was 11.1 .1 per million doses administered. And for Moderna, the previously reported rate was 2.5 million doses or 2.5 cases per million doses administered. So you'll see that the, uh, the rate for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine has come down substantially as we have continued to gather more information. And the rate for the Moderna vaccine has remained about the same. Next slide. Okay, I want to move into um, reports of deaths and mortality following COVID-19 vaccination. Next slide. So just to give you some background on how we process and follow up on reports of death to VAERS, upon receipt or notification of a reported death after a COVID-19 vaccine, the VAERS contractor will expedite processing of the report. So these are processed the day of the report. Um, they'll contact the reporter for additional information, such as medical records, death certificate, or autopsy reports. And they'll notify the state vaccine safety coordinator, these are individuals in the state health departments, of the death and provide a copy of the initial report to the vaccine safety coordinator via EPIX. Uh, physicians in CDC's Immunization Safety Office and at FDA review all reports of death following COVID-19 vaccination as soon as notified in the daily VAERS priority report. And if there were um, concerning information in these initial VAERS reports um, that might necessitate urgent action, immediate action would be taken if necessary. Attempts, multiple if necessary, are made to obtain death certificates and autopsy reports when an autopsy is conducted to ascertain the cause of death. Next slide. So um, through January 18th, um, reports of death due to any cause following COVID-19, there have been 196 reports of death due to any cause following COVID-19 vaccination to VAERS. The median age is 79, ranging from 25 to 104. 22% um, of these 196 deaths were in individuals less than 65 years of age. Um, two thirds of these reports were in long-term care residents. And um, you see the breakdown for the vaccines there in the last two rows. So these reports of death to VAERS involve temporally associated deaths following vaccination due to any cause. Um, adverse events reports to VAERS, including deaths, should not be assumed to be causally related to vaccination. Next slide. I'm gonna focus first off on um, reports of death and, and, and background mortality in long-term care residents. Next slide. So um, when looking at these reports of death um, in long-term care residents or in, in any reports of death, it's important to know about background mortality in general. And we did some calculations to, to provide you with an expected count to put these reports into perspective. 
So um, we, we estimate that about 2 million vaccine doses administered, there are about 2 million vaccine doses administered in long-term care facilities through January 18th, that's based on the COVID data tracker. And from NHSN um, data, um, we assume that about two thirds of these 2 million doses were administered to residents and about a third, the remaining third were administered to employees. So that's about 1.3 million residents vaccinated during the analytic period. We're also assuming a 22% annual mortality rate, which is based on published literature. And that equates to about 286,000 um, deaths in these 1.3 million residents. Now, when you look at the risk period, um, we assume December 21 was when vaccinations commenced in long-term care facilities. And therefore this risk period is 29 days, December 21 through January 18th. Some people could have one day of, of risk. Some people could have 21, 29 days of risk. So we, we basically split the difference and we look at 14.5 person days, which is the midpoint of the risk period. And that equates to 4% of a calendar year. Next slide. So among the 1.3 million long-term care residents vaccinated during this 29 day risk period, we would expect 11,440 deaths following vaccination due to chance alone, due to natural causes, due to background all-cause mortality rate in this population. So by comparison, VAERS has received 129 reports of death following COVID-19 vaccination in long-term care facility residents through January 18th. So mortality in long-term care residents is high and substantial numbers of deaths in this population will, will occur following vaccination as temporally associated coincidental events. Next slide. So I want to um, discuss some um, initial analysis from our colleagues at Brown University using the Genesis Healthcare data. Next slide. And I'm presenting on behalf of Dr. Bar Barbara Bardenheyer. Next slide. So Genesis Healthcare is the largest nursing home company in the US spanning 24 states. It includes 284 facilities with about 25,000 residents. And vaccination began in these, um, in these facilities on December 18th. And what the Brown investigators did was assess seven day mortality rates among vaccinated and unvaccinated residents in 118 facilities, as well as 17,000 residents in the 166 facilities that started vaccinating after January 1, 2021. Next slide. And after excluding residents with a positive SARS-CoV-2 diagnostic test within 20 days prior to their seven day observation window, mortality was lower among vaccinated versus unvaccinated residents within the same facilities and compared to residents and non yet vaccinated facilities with overlapping 95% confidence intervals. Next slide. So these findings suggest that short-term mortality rates appear unrelated to vaccination for COVID-19 and skilled nursing facility residents. And this study underscores the value of having an analytic infrastructure to support near real-time monitoring of adverse events and safety during rapid vaccine deployment in this vulnerable population. Next slide. Next slide. So I now wanna move on to reports of, of, of death. Um, I'm sorry, next slide. Um, I, I now wanna move on to reports of death in long-term care facility residents um, um, based on the VAERS data. And as I mentioned previously, when I went through the background, there were 129 um, reports of death in long-term care residents received in VAERS through January 18th. The median age was 84. Um, about half of these were female. About a third of these reported deaths involved individuals in hospice or in do not resuscitate or do not intubate status. Um, very few of these cases were autopsy cases. Um, death certificates were available for 18. Um, of, the, of the reports that we didn't have death certificates available for, these were all reviewed and the initial assessment indicated that many cases reported um, ill health or had a history of multiple comorbidities and common age-related disease like heart disease, diabetes, dementia. Next slide. 
So these are the causes of death from death certificate in the 18 um, individuals for which we had death certificates. As you can see, um, heart disease um, predominates. There are also other conditions associated with aging and several um, individuals that uh, reported um, uh, dementia. Next slide. So our overall impression is that mortality in long-term care residents is high due to the underlying health status in the long-term care resident population. The available evidence from VAERS monitoring and the Genesis population-based surveillance does not suggest a safety problem with respect to deaths in older adults residing in long-term care facilities. Case reports of deaths um, following COVID-19 vaccination to VAERS included many persons with multiple comorbidities, including some with cognitive impairment, individuals in ill health and declining states in health, and a substantial number um, that were in hospice or in DNR or DNI status. Um, the, the deaths in long-term care residents following COVID-19 vaccination are consistent with expected all-cause mortality in this population. Next slide. And our findings are also consistent with the findings of the Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety from the WHO, um, which they concluded that the, uh, the, the data did not suggest any unexpected or untoward increase in, in fatalities in frail elderly individuals, um, and that the causes of death were consistent with all cause, um, expected, expected numbers and all cause mortality in this population. Next slide. So I do wanna cover reports of death in, in individuals in community, dwell, in, uh, community dwelling settings and those less than 65 years of age. Next slide. But before I do that, I also wanna talk about um, background rates in um, community dwelling, otherwise healthy individuals. Um, we did wanna get an idea of what you might expect to see as far as sudden and unexpected death. And um, our, our estimates were based on this um, publication from Sang et al. in Circulation, where the risk of sudden cardiac death was 29.6 per 100,000 person years. Um, the inclusion criteria um, was sudden unexpected death either within an hour of symptom onset for witnessed events or within 24 hours of having been observed alive and symptom free unwitnessed uh, if they were unwitnessed. Next slide. So using similar calculations where we looked at the number of individuals vaccinated, um, looked at the risk period um, and, and, and calculated um, person years, we came up with an, with an expected number of sudden cardiac deaths of 168 in these 13.7 million community dwelling residents um, that, that we estimate were vaccinated during the period December 14th to January 18th. Um, and during the same period, um, re reported to VAERS, um, sudden cardiac deaths um, amounted to 18 deaths. So um, substantially um, more um, expected sudden cardiac deaths than they're actually reported to VAERS. Next slide. So we end in the VAERS database um, through January 18th, we have 28 reports of deaths following COVID-19 vaccination in community dwelling adults aged less than 65 years. Um, the median age in these reports is 54, range 25 to 63. The median time from vaccination to death range from the day of to 25 days after. Um, there has been one autopsy completed for pending and we have death certificate or autopsy report available for 11 of these deaths. Next slide. So here is a, uh, is, 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 is a listing of the cause of death from death certificate or autopsy report. And you'll see again that, that heart disease, cardiac um, issues account for the majority of these. And there are some other um, causes like drug overdose or complications from um, lung cancer and COVID related um, causes of death. Next slide. Next slide. So to sum up, um, as of yesterday, approximately 23.5 million COVID-19 vaccine doses have been administered in the United States. Um, 
During the time the US government has implemented the most intense and comprehensive vaccine safety monitoring program in history, overall, the safety profiles of the COVID-19 vaccines are reassuring and consistent with that observed in the pre-authorization clinical trials. Anaphylaxis has been observed following messenger RNA COVID-19 vaccines, though rarely. The data do not suggest a signal with respect to overall safety or deaths following vaccination in older adult residents of long-term care facilities. And finally, additional population-based monitoring systems will continue to gather safety data as vaccination increases and the immunization program broads. And I'm specifically talking about systems like the CDC's Vaccine Safety Data Link, the FDA Monitoring and CMS data, and the VA Electronic Health Record. Next slide. I'd just like to acknowledge the contributions of investigators from the following organizations. Next slide. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shimabakuro. Um, uh, rather than take questions right now, we're gonna proceed on to Dr. Lee's uh, presentation and then open it up to questions for both, if you don't mind. So um, Dr. Lee, uh, would you, uh, presentation on vast assessment of safety data. Yeah, thank you very much. I wanted to give uh, Dr. Shimabakuro a break from speaking for just a few minutes. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, VAST believes that, you know, these well-established vaccine safety surveillance systems uh, that remain the cornerstone of COVID-19 vaccine safety monitoring in the U.S. In addition, novel approaches, to, novel approaches to surveillance, such as vSafe, have enriched our understanding of COVID-19 vaccine safety in the early phases of vaccine deployment. And as you've heard, VAST is meeting weekly to review all available data and to ensure a coordinated approach across multiple safety surveillance systems. Next slide. Consistent with previously published clinical trial data, local and systemic reactions are commonly reported following vaccination and vSafe invaders. And it appears to be qualitatively similar at this point for Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. During the early phases of the US vaccination program, and particularly in the first few months, uh, we primarily rely on data reported to VAERS. Um, however, as Dr. Shimabokuro noted, the limitations of these data are that um, it's numerator-only data, uh, it's really descriptive in nature, and uh, these data are subject to reporting bias. As the US vaccination program matures, we will begin to rely more on the data coming from population-based surveillance systems, such as the VSD, CMS, and VA. Um, as well as done assist to understand the risk of adverse events of special interest following vaccination. Um, these systems have numerator and denominator data within a well-defined population, and comparison groups are available to ensure we have a good contextual understanding of the benefit-risk balance. Next slide. Sorry, I, still, I hear some background noise. Um, thank you. Um, uh, and, uh, so uh, vast interpretation to date, um, an anaphylaxis following COVID-19 vaccines is clearly being closely monitored. The estimated rates that Dr. Shimabukuro uh, provided currently range from 2.8 to 5 per million doses using Brighton collaboration uh, cri criteria. And in response, CDC has recommended risk mitigation strategies, including screening for risk prior to vaccination, monitoring for symptoms post-vaccination, and early recognition and management of anaphylaxis on site. Um, in addition, provider and patient education is ongoing by CDC and partners. Next slide. As an example of the timeliness of the response to potential vaccine safety signals, our federal safety colleagues have published the available data on allergic reactions following the Pfizer vaccine on January 6th, the Moderna vaccine on January 22nd, and a clinical update in JAMA on January 21st. Next slide. In addition, anaphylaxis um, you know, has been a topic of discussion at our ACIP meetings, on COCA calls, and on other calls with broad clinical audiences to ensure that we are safely delivering vaccines to patients and the public. Um, CDC has developed a pre-vaccination checklist that incorporates questions about prior known history of severe allergic reactions. Um, and clinical guidance documents are continually and in real time updated 
uh, to ensure that individuals who are at risk for an allergic reaction are monitored for 30 minutes post vaccination and that all vaccination sites are prepared to diagnose and manage severe allergic reactions on site. So over the course of the past six weeks, you can see that our safety systems are working quickly to ensure a timely response. Next slide. Uh, serious adverse events following COVID-19 vaccination is being closely monitored. Uh, data in the US and Europe suggest that case reports of death are consistent with all cause mortality rates, particularly in frail elderly individuals. And it's important to remember that COVID-19 vaccines are designed to prevent COVID-19 related mortality, but not mortality due to other causes. Uh, we anticipate additional vaccine safety surveillance systems will begin reporting data as we start to vaccinate a larger proportion of the US population. And VAST will continue to update uh, the ACIP COVID-19 vaccines work group, the ACIP secretariat and the ACIP on a regular basis. Next slide. And with that, I'll conclude. And um, uh, if it's okay with Dr. Romero, we'd be happy to open up this session for questions. So the sessions are open for questions. Dr. Alt. I guess this question's for either of you. When do you plan to look at the pregnancy data that was either generated from VSA for the VSD system? Um, for for uh, VAERS, I mean, we are currently reviewing that data as it comes in. There's limited data available right now, and um, we would be happy to um, present that at a future ACIP meeting. Um, the the VSAVE data, we're in the process of enrolling um, individuals into the pregnancy registry, um, and we want to start looking at that data pretty quickly, and I think there would be an opportunity to, to present that information um, at, at a future meeting as well. And then did you ask about VSD as well? Yes, I, yeah. I mean, I'm guessing yeah. since healthcare workers skew towards young and female, we've talked about this many times, That and you said that a lot of the employees are the first part of the VSD data. We'll have some data from that too, and plus we'll have a control group uh, so, for that. Yeah, we have several, um, we have a couple studies um, planned, a couple surveillance projects planned in VSD, and we'll be um, accumulating data as well. Um, and we'd certainly be, um, once we think we have sufficient data and meaningful results, we'd be happy to come back to the the ACIP and, and present that information. But I mean, the 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 surveillance is ongoing. We're collecting um, we're collecting data. Um, it's 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 a, it's it's an active process right now. And um, I think when we uh, when we have sufficient data, we'll, we'd be happy to come back and present that. Thanks, Dr. Chen. Yeah, thank you for the uh, the terrific uh, presentation of the safety information. This is a question that that may be parallel and independent from your group, but but perhaps you might be able to answer it. And this is um, that there was the more recent updated guidance uh, about um, severe but non anaphylaxis uh, reactions, and I know that there's movement within uh, some of my colleagues, at least. Um, in the allergy immunology community to talk about desensitization protocol guidelines or something like that to give further guidance for these non-anaphylaxis events? Is there any uh, movement uh, within uh, the safety group to discuss some of these approaches or if any of these were events that were classified in the say Brighton class four or five categories? I'm going to defer to my colleagues that are working on the clinical guidance um, for the first part of your your question. Um, as far as the allergic reactions that were um, that were in the the publications, um, basically we cast a very wide net. So we looked for um, severe allergic any allergic reactions that were severe or suggestive of anaphylaxis. And then we reviewed those and they basically fell into three different buckets. Either they were anaphylaxis according to Brighton or they, they did not meet Brighton criteria, but they were judged to be allergic reactions or they were um, judged to be um, non-allergic reactions like, uh, like vasovagal or anxiety related reactions. But as far as the clinical guidance, I'm gonna have to defer to others who are working in that space. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. 
Thank you, sir. As always, excellent presentation, greatly appreciated. First, a, a comment and a question, you know, especially with the reactogenicity. I think it's really incumbent on us who are vaccinating patients to really stress to them and make them well aware of the potential uh, reactions. I personally experienced the fever chills and rigors after that second dose, and they were quite severe, uh, to make sure that the patients are aware of it so that they will come back and do their second dose. But my question is, did they look at either with the reactogenicity or the anaphylaxis patients who previously had COVID infection and received the vaccine? And did they tease apart that data or was this just all comers? I think that the data on, we didn't specifically look at that, although that information um, may be captured in the VAERS report. So uh, I think... Anecdotally, we've heard about um, previous infection and the possibility of a more severe reactogenicity when getting a dose of COVID vaccine. And we're exploring um, options where we can use the vSafe data to, to see if we can um, to see if we can in further investigate um, that that potential um, sa safety issue. Um, I, I think there's limited data on that right now, but we are we are looking at ways to which we can um, get better information on that. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Sanchez. Thank you, Jose. No, I no, thank you for the um, reassuring information. Although the reactogenicity is, um, I mean, there's no question it it happens, but um, I actually. My comment was actually related to the previous one, and they're anecdotal. There's a lot of anecdotes about people who've had COVID-19 previously who are having reactions who I'm being told by them that it was actually worse than the original infection. And I think it's really important to be able to capture that and, and be safe. I mean, I don't know if you can add that or some way of of changing that? Have you had COVID-19 before? Because it's not asked. So I, I do think that that's really important. And the, and so, um, so I wanted, so that was um, related to that. The only other thing, I guess, um, in the pregnancy uh, data, are you, is it, are you also going to be looking at breastfeeding mothers? And is there anything that's going to be, are you do, having any, um, infant data capture as well in terms of women who were vaccinated during during the time that they were breastfeeding. Sure. To, for your first point, I think we, we recognize that there is concern out there about prior infection. Um, and we, we're actually exploring some options for doing um, some a, a nested study in, in VSAFE to see if we can um, further assess that 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 issue. Um, so we are we understand that's a concern, and um, we're we're looking at ways in which we can um, get better information um, and get a better idea of, of 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 what's happening with prior infection and vaccination. Um, as far as uh, as far as the um, the the maternal um, safety um, activities. Um, the, the VSAFE pregnancy registry um, is, is, is enrolling women um, through the duration of their pregnancy and then following the infants out for three months. So we will get information on infant outcomes through the VSAFE pregnancy registry. Thank you. And another question. So you presented data up to seven days, right? Uh, reactogenicity up to yeah. seven days, correct. Okay. Because what we're finding actually was, it was reported in the New England Journal, the seven to 14 day of erythema and swelling that's been also noted. I'm sure you'll be capturing that as well. Uh, I, I believe there are ways to, to get, get at, um, at, at uh, uh, adverse reactions beyond that seven day um, period and into the seven to 14 day window. I, I believe that that's possible in VSAFE. Yeah, I think that'd be important as well because it's certainly anecdotally, again, it's been, uh, uh, it has been reported. I've, I've seen it from other uh, colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, Sorry, 
thank you for, for that great presentation. Um, uh, two questions. The, the first, uh, you know, given that we're about five weeks out now from the, the first doses of these vaccines, um, have there been any reports of any MIS-like uh, syndromes in younger adults? And that's question number one. And number two, are you all monitoring um, vaccination in uh, patients with so-called long COVID? Thank you. Um, to your first question, um, MIS-C and MIS-A are adverse events of special interest that are being monitored in, in VAERS and in the Vaccine Safety Data Link. I'm not aware of, of any reports of uh, MIS-A in younger adults to date. Um, reports that met case definition, at least. And uh, what was your, I'm sorry, your second question? Second question is regarding um, people with, there is the question about people with prior COVID infections. And I'm asking about uh, patients with this so-called long COVID, so persistent symptoms uh, long after a, an initial COVID infection. So, the, I mean, those individuals would be captured in VAERS provided that, um, that, that, that past medical history was documented in VAERS. Um, we are able to, uh, we do have information on uh, COVID infection in, in, in VSD. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm not, I don't think that that's specifically been incorporated into the monitoring, but that could certainly be something that we take a look at in the future more as a research project. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dries. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Dr. Shimabukuro and is about the risk of anaphylaxis. So knowing that these data are early and the risk estimates have already changed and may continue to change as more data comes in, at what point or, or what criteria would need to be met to cease the recommendation for 15 minutes of monitoring post-vaccination, post particularly among those without a known allergy history? Um, this risk seems exceptionally low, and I ask because as we're expanding vaccination and planning all these high throughput events, often the, the, find, the limiting factor is finding space for the people to hang out after vaccination, and plus the need for additional clinical staff to perform the monitoring can be a limitation. Um, thank you for the excellent presentation. So, so I, 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 I think we have sufficient data to say that 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 anaphylaxis can occur following um, messenger RNA vaccines and anaphylaxis can occur following any vaccine. As far as, um, as, far as the um, post-vaccination post observation period and, and adjusting that, I'd, I'd have to defer to the folks that, are, that develop the clinical guidance um, on, on, on if and when that would be warranted. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Daly. Um, yeah, thanks so much. So, you know, I think your presentation, Dr. Shimabukuro and Dr. Lee's as well, you know, they're just important reminders to us all that our vaccine safety knowledge is really gonna, gonna evolve over time. And it's just, you know, important to recognize that what you described as this being the most intense and comprehensive vaccine safety undertaking ever, ever having been sort of taken by the U.S. government. And, the, and I'd add to that just that this also seems to be the most timely because this has all happened in about the last five or six weeks. So just just a comment that we're just so very fortunate to have such well-established systems in place, such as VAERS and the VSD and and how helpful it's been to add new systems like, like vSAFE. And just just to just to close by saying that uh, you know these safety data are just critical for public confidence, um, and then they're, they're also very important for clinical considerations around vaccination. So it's just reassuring to know how much careful attention is being paid to vaccine safety. So thanks to you and to the Immunization Safety Office at the CDC. Thanks, I appreciate that, Doctor Alt. Uh, your hand is up. Is that a leftover or a new question? Leftover, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Um, Dr. Cohn, I think we're a little ahead of schedule. Um, do you want to give uh, the group a little bit longer break or do you want to bring them back in 15 minutes? 
I think given the very short lunch break we had, uh, having some additional time uh, would be excellent. So, um, so shall we come back then at, uh, at half past the hour? That would be great. So at half past the hour, please. Thank you all.